So how concerning is the spread of the virus now? Dr. David Fisman is an infectious disease specialist and the head of epidemiology at the University of Toronto's Dalalana School of Public Health. And he joins us from Toronto. Thank you so much for joining us, Dr. Fisman. Thanks for having me. So, you know, it's interesting because even the focus of our interview has changed because of how dramatically this story continues to shift, even though we're seeing a dramatic drop in the number of confirmed cases coming out of mainland China. Part of what we're really focused on now is the spread to 28 other countries, including South Korea, with the fourth largest city being in lockdown. And in terms of concern, how, how much fear should there be out there of the containment outside of mainland China? Well, I don't think it's a matter of fear. I think it's a matter of concern. Today is not a good day in terms of the epidemiology of this disease. As you point out, there are chains of transmission now in a few places, Japan, Italy, South Korea. In terms of Italy and South Korea, what they're seeing is something we've seen before, which is this disease seems to produce super spreader events, which are very large clusters of disease associated with a single case. That was the case in uh, Korea, where this very large outbreak is really associated with uh, gathering at a, at a mega church. Um, I think Italy is probably going to be something similar. The real concerning development for many of us over the last two days has been the situation in Iran, where Iran started off by announcing that they had deaths. They, they're now up to, I think, five uh, or six deaths now. It takes a long time for people to die from this disease. It takes probably two to three weeks if they get medical care. So what that, and, and we know that only about 2% of people who get this infection die. So if you take six deaths over the last couple of days in Iran, what that tells us with a 2% case fatality rate is that they probably had at least 300 cases three weeks ago. That would have doubled to 600, would have doubled to 1,200, would have doubled to 2,400 new cases. So they're well into the many thousands of cases most likely in Iran. That's corroborated by the fact that we're seeing exported cases from Iran pop up here in Canada, in Vancouver, as well as in the United Arab Emirates and in Lebanon. So in a sense, I'm less worried about Korea and Italy and Japan where you see things and you know the local public health officials are on it and are working on it, and that's why you, you see what's going on there. I find it much more concerning when we talk about a country like Iran, where this epidemic has obviously grown to quite large proportions invisibly, with nobody noticing or nobody, uh, perhaps people have noticed, but nobody saying anything about it. And I think Iran may be a story that repeats in the weeks to come. There are other countries like Indonesia, Cambodia, Nigeria, with close travel ties to China that should have cases by now, but which don't. And that silence to me is more worrisome than disease activities in, in the places you mentioned at the top, uh, Korea, Korea, Japan, Italy. In terms of the World Health Organization then and other international health authorities, how should they react to that very concerning piece of information that you raised here that there's really a lack of knowledge in some areas, Iran being yeah. perhaps one of them, where there could be just quite an outbreak uh, in that part of the world and no knowledge of it? Yeah, I think that's... Um you, you know, I I, th I think the WHO has actually been on that for some time. Um, uh, about two weeks ago, they started talking about how they were going to get testing kits uh, for this virus into countries, particularly in Africa and South America, that lacked the capacity for testing, because you can't do anything about it if you don't know it's there. Dr. Tedros has said repeatedly that the world, in its response to what is now probably going to be a pandemic, is only going to be as strong as its weakest link. Um, so I think there's great awareness at the WHO that they, they really need to focus on, on, those, on those weaker countries. Unfortunately, um, once we have this probably widespread in Iran, Iran has a lot of travel to and um, shares borders with, um, uh, well, certainly a failed state like Iraq, where there may be, be a case as of today. There's a preliminary report of a case in Iraq. And of course, one worries about Syria, where there's a lot of Iranian involvement in Syria. And Syria has people packed together in refugee camps, which would absolutely be um, a nightmare if this got into refugee camps. So I think, I think folks are starting to 
move away from the idea of containment and towards the idea of slowing this down, uh, catching it as it's introduced into countries and stopping those chains of transmission when they're small and early. But it, it is a much more grave situation today than it was a few days ago. I will end on a happy note and um, reiterate what you said about China. China shows us that this is controllable. You know, China seems to have their very large epidemic now on the wane. Other countries may be able to do that, but the cost to China economically in terms of uh, the human cost as well has just been absolutely tremendous. And I'm not sure that every country in the world can do what China has accomplished. And very finally, I wanted to ask you about one of the regions that you have touched on, in fact, and that's the continent of Africa, because we know as it stands right now, at the latest chance that we got to look at figures, there's only one reported case in Egypt. But there have been a lot of questions about how prepared uh, countries within the African continent would be to deal with any potential outbreak or spread of coronavirus there, given how inundated their health care system is already. Um, so wondering what sort of, um, I guess, actions or next steps can be taken in order to ensure that they are also prepared. Yeah, there's there's been a pretty concerted effort to build particularly local capacity for um, laboratory responses to outbreaks. There's actually an African Center for Disease Control now uh, that largely came out of the Ebola experience in 2014, 2015. So I think a lot of African countries are in a better place. The continent has more resources and uh, sort of better organizational structures. But there's no question that this is going to be uh, a great challenge uh, to countries that have limited resources. And um, the less resources you have to deal with this, the harder it's going to be to uh, to control it successfully. So, yeah, no, I think you're flagging a very important concern that's been a concern for a while. And again, to get back to Dr. Tedros's point, we're only as strong as the weakest link. And uh, I know I'm going to strike a lot of your listeners as some sort of squishy leftist when I say this. I'm just a, you know, middle of the road public health doctor. We need to invest in health in the weakest countries in order to protect all of us, uh, low income, middle income and high income countries. It's, a, it's an inter, you know, it's an interlocked, interlaced, interconnected world. And we really are only as strong as the, as the weakest link. So we, we, we need to do better about investing in health in, in, in low income countries. Well, we really appreciate your important analysis on this topic today. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Fisman. Thank you.